Ladies and, <coughs> ladies and gentlemen, welcome. My name is Tanya Beckett. I'm a news presenter and business presenter for the BBC. And sitting with me here is a man who probably needs no introduction. He is John Green. He is author of one of his many roles, young adult fiction. Let me just give you some uh, data. He won the 2006 Prince Award. This was for his debut novel, Looking for Alaska. His sixth novel, which is uh, The Fault in Our Stars, was actually number one at the box office in 2014. It was uh, made into a film. So that in of itself is success enough, but there's plenty more, John, I think, that you can outline for us. Let's just start with your, with your writings, first of all. If you look at the books, they seem to me to have a fairly dark theme. These are aimed at children, I would call, still call them children, but they're 17, 18, that type of age. And yet you address some pretty serious things. Uh, the death of young people, the concept of death and loss and, and, and illness. Why do you go into those dark corners? Well, I think, um, I, I, because I think it's a big part of life, and I think that it's a big consideration for young people, um, although not just young people, it turns out that death is sort of an ongoing uh, concern. Um, I, <coughs> when did you discover that? <laughs> when I was a teenager, that's probably why I, why I write those characters. Is, is that the reason that it preoccupied you as a teenager? Um, I, you know, I, I, I think that death probably didn't preoccupy me as a teenager until I lost a friend um, in a car accident when I was 16, and after that it did. Uh, the problem with death, um, it, well, I guess for me, uh, my personal death, obviously catastrophic, but uh, there, is, there is inside of that a, a much larger problem, uh, which is the, the problem of the end of us, the, the problem that uh, this beautiful Congress Hall and everything else that we make or say or do uh, will eventually uh, be lost. It will be, it will be gone, and not in the sense that 99% of Roman texts are lost, but uh, in the sense that uh, there will be no humans or anyone else to appreciate it. And while there's lots of exciting stuff happening here with people talking about transhumanism and us, up, us uploading our consciousnesses to the internet and getting into spaceships and traveling thousands of light years away, the heat death of the universe, like it will come, there will come a time. And, um, and, and that idea that everything, uh, you know, everything that comes together falls apart. Everything uh, that, that, that in a way to be uh, is to know that you will one day not be um, is a really important and difficult idea to get your head around. And I, don't, and I think if we have a worldview that doesn't acknowledge that, um, we, end up, uh, we end up either sort of sticking our heads in the sand or else being on the wrong course. I think that there is great hope to be found uh, within life as we know it to be, which is a thing that ends. And so I try to, I, I, do, I do sometimes write about death. I, I did write a comic novel, it's just nobody read it. Um, <laughs> I do sometimes write about death, but, um, and, and, but I, I try to write uh, I believe that, that good fiction is hopeful. I believe that good fiction is optimistic, and I believe that if it isn't optimistic, it's kind of dishonest. So I try to be hopeful. Right. T tell me a little bit about the storyline in The Fault in Our Stars. It's, it's very painful, isn't it? Yeah. Um, uh, hopefully. I hope so. Um, I, when I uh, first graduated from college, I worked briefly as a student chaplain at a children's hospital. Uh, I was going to become a minister and then dropped out of divinity school on the first day and uh, went a different path. But uh, ever since then, I've been trying to write, I, I, I'd been trying to write about uh, illness um, in children and about uh, the relationships that um, kids form um, with other sick kids and also about the stigmatization that they have to live with, that there's this sort of emotional um, trauma of being seen as other, not being able to participate, not just in sports, but in converse, you know, regular everyday conversations where someone's like, oh my God, I could, not, I could not wear those shoes, I would literally die. And then you look at your friend and you're like, oh, whoops, you know, because she's literally dying. And so the, her presence makes everything awkward and uncomfortable. Um, and I, that, that, that social 
uh, stigma really fascinated me because most of the stories that we have, and we have tons and tons of cancer, I mean, it's a genre, essentially, the, the cancer romance, um, in which uh, the first one was Love Story by Eric Siegel. I don't know if you remember that book, but uh, basically, you fall in love, somebody gets cancer, the healthy person learns important lessons about how to be grateful for every day. In that book, the healthy person learns that love means never having to say you're sorry. That was the famous line from that book, love means never having to say you're sorry, which is the most ludicrous <laughs> definition of love. I mean, my experience is that love means constantly having to say that you're sorry. Um, but. Um, the problem I have with that, that way, and this is what inspired, this is the other thing that inspired the book, I guess. The problem that I, I have with that way of looking at the world is that it imagines that sick people exist so that healthy people can learn lessons and that the meaning of a sick person's life is not intrinsic to them, but is instead somehow dependent upon uh, healthy people. And I just don't buy that. I just don't buy the argument that, um, th that, that the sick or the poor or the systemically disenfranchised are in, are in some way uh, you know, suffering nobly. Um, I, I, and, I, and I think you know, we're all trying to find meaning within our lives, and that ultimately is what I wanted Hazel's story, Hazel and Gus's story to be about, is them trying to find meaning inside of their own lives rather than trying to you know, make other people feel lucky or grateful. Right, so what conclusion do you come to there? As you rightly say, all of us at some point will die, but yeah. for many people it seems like a very distant prospect, for other people a more present prospect, but yeah. at some point we have to find some meaning in life that doesn't make us think, well, you know, feel too fatalistic, that wants to achieve something or, or do something positive with our lives. How do we balance those <clears throat> two things? Right, there's a great line in uh, F. Scott Fitzgerald's The Crack Up, I'm gonna maul it, um, that uh, one must um, hold together the, the um, a sense of the futility of, of effort and a sense of the necessity to struggle on anyway. Yeah. Um, and I really, I really believe that. Uh, Yes, it's true, someday all of this will be gone, um, but not today. Uh, yes, it's true that uh, someday we will all die, but not today. And so we have incredible opportunities um, today, you know, and I think uh, that's, that's what gets me uh, excited, you know. I, not just in writing, but in the work that my brother and I do, um, in terms of our philanthropy, like what gets me excited is that, uh, you know, we've, we've seen tremendous change in the last 25 years. We've seen massive reductions in infant mortality, massive reductions in maternal mortality. And if you take seriously um, you know, the body and the sanctity of the body and the sanctity of human life, then those are huge accomplishments. And um, that's the kind of thing that, that's the kind of place where I find meaning. And then I also find meaning uh, within, my, within love, within my personal relationships with the people I love. Um, and I find a lot of purpose in that. I find a lot of uh, connection uh, and meaning there. Um, and so those are kind of, I guess, the twin uh, poles that uh, allow me to uh, know that all effort is going to be ultimately futile and also know that it's not futile now. And that's what's important. OK, we're going to come back to that sort of dark theme a little <laughs> bit later on. But I want to lighten things up and talk a, a little bit about your vlogging. Yeah. OK, now, um, in the UK, we have seen particularly quite young male vloggers become stars. Sure, many There's of them are my friends. <laughs> Are they? I think this one in South Africa, he just sort of talks about his day. But there are these women who he's, he wrote a book about, his vlogging, in fact. And there are many young ladies, you know, teenagers, who flocked to get a signing of his book and so on. How do you make that work? How do you make yourself into a star if you weren't already? Well, I mean, yeah, first be super young and, and crazy handsome. That's been my strategy. <laughs> No, it's funny, you know, the, the, I, I feel like the mainstream media often dismisses uh, uh, internet uh, personalities or internet video makers because they tend to be young and because they tend to be good looking. And I feel like I am a great, uh, am a great counterbalance to that. And there are also, I, it, it, because it isn't about that really, uh, I mean, I'm sure that's, I'm sure that's part of um, what part of what an audience might feel connected to, but it, for me, I don't think that's the center of it. I think what makes it, what makes it magical and when it works is when it feels like an authentic relationship. Before I started making videos in 2006, I was a huge fan of this guy, Zay Frank, who basically invented video blogging, all the jump cuts, all the conventions of videoing, he basically invented. And I mean, I felt like we 
were friends except that he just he didn't know me but but that we we were friends and I and I looked forward every day to his to his videos and that's the kind of relationship that I want to have with our community um, you know the traditional model for for media making is that you make stuff for people um, and you make stuff for as many people as possible because it, it, we don't have uh, a, a robust public broadcasting system, and so we rely a lot heavily on advertising. And adverti advertisers only care about eyeballs. They only care about the number of impressions that they can get, or too, they care too much, I would argue, about it. So in traditional broadcast, in traditional media, you want the biggest possible audience, um, and and that's and you want them to think of you as separate, as someone who's making something for you that you like. And with online media, uh, I don't feel like I'm making something for my viewers. I feel like I'm making something with them. And that's literally true in the sense that when they comment on a video, they change the video page. They reshape the, they reshape the context in which the video is being viewed. Um, but it's also figuratively true in the sense that they inspire every video idea that I have. They're the ones asking the questions. If they say, I, you know, uh, in comments, I don't understand what's going on with the deficit, and is the, is the stimulus a good idea, then that gives me the opportunity to make a video about you know, debt to GDP ratios and stuff. So that sense of doing things with an audience rather than for an audience is the first thing that I think is the key to uh, online media success. And the second thing that I think is really important is not caring about how many people watch your videos, but caring about how many people love them. Not caring about the number of eyeballs but caring about the number, uh, the amount of passion that's being created. I don't think it's ultimately that interesting. I mean, again, no offense to anyone here who happens to be in this business, but like, ultimately, I'm not interested in making, uh, we have a very successful reality program in America called Deadliest Catch, where you uh, follow around some crab fishermen and they, so far don't die, but it's very scary and intense and they catch the crab or they don't and it's, uh, it's, it's, and it's fun to watch. I don't want to make Deadliest Catch because it's fun to watch, I watch it, millions and millions of people watch it, but I don't love it. I wouldn't buy a Deadliest Catch t-shirt, you know? I wouldn't go around advertising my affection for Deadliest Catch. I wouldn't put in my Twitter bio, you know, author, YouTuber, Deadliest Catch fan. Um, and I want to make the kind of stuff that may not appeal to the broadest possible audience, but will have that kind of depth of engagement where someone will say on their Twitter bio, you know, that they're a nerd fighter, or they will say on their Twitter bio, that they love my books or love Crash Course. We have that one on, you know, the ice truckers. Yeah, same thing. Yeah, we yeah. have that. Yeah, the same. Yeah. That's Similar. Got, I mean, it's like if somebody but, came with a TV proposal to me and said, "This is what we're going to do," I was like, "Okay, I think you need to get help." And, <laughs> and then you watch it, and you think, "Oh, wow, that's such good." It's quite, it's quite, it's quite <laughs> watchable, get, but well, it's, it's not. It's so, people it's, in adversity. It's, it's a slightly different thing that, that I think, from a television point of view, that you're creating, isn't it? That, that's the. Thing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm, so I'm not tell trying me, to. Yeah. When we're talking about television matters, you're very interested in education. Yeah. Talk to me about how you create um, these, these educational videos and what it is you're trying to do and what you think is important to educate young people about? Well, that's several good questions um, that I might forget one of, so okay, remind well, let's me start. if I well, you, what, right. what are you going to educate people about, what are young people? What do you think is important? So in 2011, YouTube uh, offered us some startup capital to make proper educational video with animation and curriculum consultants and educators and scripts and teleprompters and, um, you know, traditional TV costs. I don't know what it costs, actually, but we were, we've made the first season of Crash Course for about $150 a minute, um, which was you know, $149.50 a minute more than uh, we'd ever spent on online video. Um, and so instead of it just being me in my basement, suddenly there were some people to help us out. And, um, and I started out uh, kind of introducing world history, um, tied a little bit to the AP curriculum in the US, the sort of upper level high school curriculum in the US. And my brother started out um, introducing ideas in uh, biology tied to the AP curriculum. Um, and we did that uh, partly because we think biology and, and world history are super important, but also because we felt like uh, there weren't good free educational videos uh, out there. Um, you know, there, this is a huge uh, for-profit business, but um, we felt like this stuff could be made for free and distributed for free very easily. But, but 
to your question about what is important to teach, uh, I, our approach with Crash Course, we try very hard not to um, teach subjects just because they're in school. Like I have a huge problem with the current way that, uh, with the way I was educated, with the way I think most kids in the US at least are educated these days, which is that school is treated as a series of arbitrary hurdles that have been set up in front of you that you are told that you need to jump over in order to get a piece of paper that says that you can jump over some more arbitrary hurdles in order to get a piece of paper that says that you can get a job. And that this is the reason that you are educated is so that you can get a job. Um, when in fact, I think the reason that like as a social order we've invented public education is because we sort of decided as a group that a well-educated population is, is better. It's better for us. Uh, it's not just better for students, it's better for adults. Uh, the reason I pay taxes for schools even though I don't have a kid in school is because uh, it's better for me to have a well-educated population of Americans. Um, but when you treat it like it's just like, why do you have to learn math because you have to learn math? Why do you have to learn biology because you have to learn biology to get the degree? Why do you have to, you know, why do we have to read Wuthering Heights? Because you have to read Wuthering Heights to get the degree. Instead of saying, why do we have to read, what, well, Wuthering Heights isn't a great example, actually. Why do we have to read, uh, why do we have to read Pride and Prejudice? Because it's a great novel. Mm. Because it's going to help you in your life. Because it's going to help you to understand the world around you. Because you'll get the Jane Austen jokes that you don't currently get. Because, uh, because it'll, it'll make you a better boyfriend, right? Because, it's, and that, so we try to approach it from that angle. Like, why do you learn history? Because it will make you a, a better and more interesting person, and it will allow you to contextualize your life and the world around you better, which in turn will make you a better participant in civic society, will make you a better, uh, and will make you more money in the long run, and will be good for the economy in the long run. Okay. So that's the approach that we try to take. All right, let me um, ask you also about, um, gosh, I've forgotten the question I was going to ask now. Sorry. <laughs> that sometimes happens, I'm completely wrong for it. The theme of this, forum, the World Economic Forum, is the fourth industrial revolution. We yeah. hear a lot in business and in, in the area that I work in about the need for emotional intelligence. What, what the fourth industrial revolution is supposed to be about is when uh, not robots necessarily, but artificial intelligence allows people to take, allows robots uh, or computers to take the jobs of accountants. It's about brain, not brawn. And this is this would be a this would be a quite a frightening next step. And the prediction is, that in fact, millions of jobs will be lost to this. So if you are educating uh, young people, what you need to tell them is that they need what we call emotional intelligence. The question is what we mean by that. But it seems very much that that is what you're teaching, isn't it? It's certainly what we want to encourage in the classroom. So, I mean, Crash Course is not intended to replace classroom experiences, precisely because I think that so much Crash of Course the, is the name that you've Yeah, sorry, to. that's the name of our channel. Um, precisely because I think that so much of the, like, emotional intelligence uh, is learned in school. Uh, it's learned from peers, but it's also learned from sort of modeling by, by teachers. And I'm, I, I can't replace that, and I also don't want to. Um, maybe there will be robots that can replace it someday, but not <laughs> I'm not, that's not, that's not going to be my life, um, or not my job, you know. Um, so I am, I, I do, but I do want to introduce some nuance to these topics and some critical thinking to them so that when we, for instance, teach history, when we make history videos, I don't just want to make um, videos that are about history. I also want to make videos that talk about the different ways that we study history, different approaches to the study of history, and what's wrong with some of them, and right with some of them, and, and you know where privilege functions in the conversation and stuff like that, so that you aren't just learning um, about the Atlantic slave trade or about the you know supposed fall of the Roman Empire, which I don't as far as I can tell, it didn't ever actually happen. Um, but instead, you're learning about approaches to the study of history. Why, why you know, why, why did, why, you know, why did this historian write this way? And that, those critical thinking skills, um, hopefully, will be useful in this future job market. I do think that those are going to be important. I'm going to use your analogy of the Roman Empire. The reason that it. Uh came back, uh, there was a resurgence, was primarily art, right? Yeah. So um, art plays a bigger role than sometimes people give it credit for. 
What is the role of art now? We see so much turmoil. I mean, thinking, you know, as a European, I'm thinking particularly about the war in Syria and this, this absolute flood of uh, uh, migrants in a very poor state emerging from that part of the world. Yeah. And finding sometimes uh, welcoming arms in Europe, but often not. Yeah. I know the BBC doesn't, but I feel very strongly about using the word refugee when we're talking about refugees because there are international laws for refugees and uh, certainly the people escaping conflict in Syria are conflict refugees. Um, I, I, think the, um, I think the role of art is uh, complicated. I, I don't really believe in uh, the sort of like George Orwell, Ayn Rand novel of ideas. I actually like George Orwell a lot, he's a great writer, but like I don't believe in um, like the, that kind of politicized novel. Um, so prediction of the future, in a way. Yeah, well, the I mean, Orwell, of... Orwell just turned out to be very prophetic. But at the time, it was a, you know, a highly politicized novel making arguments about uh, communism and totalitarianism uh, at a time when it wasn't clear to lots of, you know, when a time when lots of people were communists and lots of people thought totalitarian governments were the right solution. Um, and I, I don't, I, those, novels, those novels can have an impact. Uh, to, me, the, but to me, the most important and interesting thing that art can do uh, is to be a way into empathy. Um, is a, it, it, it's a, it can help us become more empathetic. It is incredibly difficult when we think about the conflict in Syria, or when we think about re refugee crises in South Sudan, or we think about um, you know, conflict in other places in the world. It is so, so, or even when we think about ISIS uh, and, and people, uh, people living um, in, in that part of Syria and Iraq, it's so hard for us not to imagine those people monolithically because we don't know in many, we very rarely know their individual stories. So we tend to see them as blocks. We tend to see Islam as a, as a block, as one thing and fail to appreciate the astonishing, you know, millennia old diversity uh, within uh, Islamic tradition. Uh, and we, and we, when we do that, uh, we dehumanize people. We're not seeing them as individual people who are like us. We're seeing them as other. We're seeing them as a them. And uh, that's very problematic. And I, I think that one thing art does do well is help us to imagine what it's like to be someone else. Like, I am stuck inside of this particular consciousness and this particular body, and it is the only consciousness I will ever have. These eyes are the only eyes I will ever see the world out of. And that is this horrible, horrible prison when it comes to trying to imagine what it's like to be someone else. I have no idea, ultimately, what it's like to be you. I have no idea what it's like to be a woman. I have no idea what it's like to be British. I have no idea, you know, the, and, and so, the challenge is, how do I learn that? How do I learn to imagine, how do I learn to listen better? Um, and I think art is a good way to do that because when I read a story that I love, like when I read Catcher in the Rye, I don't read it and think like, this is me uh, reading about Holden Caulfield, I feel like I'm living inside the mind of Holden Caulfield. I feel like I've escaped this prison of myself and I'm able to live in someone else's body. And that's very powerful for me. And so to me, it's, it's really empathy is at the core of what I'm trying to do. Jolly good. I'm going to open the floor for questions. Would anybody just put your hand up if you have a question you would like to ask? Loads of them. Um, yes, let's just take this one first of all, and then this gentleman straight afterwards, if we may. I'm sure there are questions here. Too. Jen Hyatt, a global uh, swab social entrepreneur. Um, my daughter Kate would just be in awe that I'm sitting <laughs> in the same room with you. Um, I asked her recently why she was uh, so obsessed with your novels, and she just said, simply, Mom, there are no happy endings. <laughs> and I think that that's, uh, I think that's, uh, that's amazing. And that your commentary on emotional intelligence is, is profound. Turning to something like Paper Towns, I'm also quite interested in your view on you know, both of those central characters in that. Uh, really, I see as rites of passage in different ways where they have a relationship, different kinds of relationship to, to risk. Uh, and risk is, is, is profound for both of them, but very different. And one might see that Margot is the risky character, but actually possibly not. I'd be really interested in your reflections on self and risk in the fourth, in the fourth revolution for, 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 for teenagers. Yeah, that's a big question. I mean, I think um, I'm very interested in how we identify the self uh, in this contemporary world, you know, in, in a digitized world where the self that we uh, project 
you know, we project different selves online and even on, in different platforms online. And, um, and that, can, uh, that can mess with, I think, especially when you're young, with your understanding of like, what is the core you? And in general, that whole question of like, wh wh what do I mean when I talk about myself is, is insanely complicated. And I've been trying to write about it for the last few years, and we'll see if I ever finish another novel. But um, uh, I, I, do think that, um, I do think that people often identify themselves, or, or one of the ways that we understand ourselves is as, as risk-taking or risk-averse. Um, I think there's something about adolescence where you're almost you're attracted to the you know to the flame to the fire. Um, I, I felt this intense urge to self-destruct when I was a teenager or to act out in self-destructive ways, um, and I didn't even really know where it came from. But for me, risk was risk was about trying to uh, to establish the boundaries of myself, I guess. Um, and I had a much more sort of Margot worldview than than Quentin worldview. Um, but I, I I did I I also um, you know got a lot of second chances, which which most people don't get. Right. I, I think also what's interesting is how different people perceive risk, isn't it? Yeah. Uh, yes, please. Uh, so my daughter Julia is also glad that I'm here to, to, to hear John. Why didn't your y'all's kids come? Should, well, exactly. We should, we should, we should have, yeah. have kids with. Yeah. I think we should be FaceTiming them live. That's, that's the real future with. Um, John says you are so brilliant at understanding teenagers, which most of us can't, and at, at speaking with them and empathizing with them and, and speaking for them. I just wonder, since you also worry, whether you worry about getting old and losing that understanding, or oh, even more to the point, perhaps, whether you worry that when your son, son, right, uh, becomes a teenager, and like all teenagers says, Dad, you don't understand me or us. Yeah. Uh, yeah. And then you might have a point. <laughs> yeah. Uh, what does that do to your career? Or what does that do to yeah. your whole worldview? That's going to introduce some self-doubt, I Yeah, for sure. I mean, I don't, I, be, no matter how well you uh, are able to communicate with teenagers outside of your family, you'll never be able to communicate effectively with the ones inside of your family, I think. I mean, for, 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 I think for most teenagers, frankly, like good, good parents, uh, di disappear. You know, they just don't think it's painful to hear this. I'm sure, but like, I just when I was a teenager, I, my parents were good parents, and that meant that I just thought about them very, very rarely. Um, <laughs> I was not particularly <laughs> concerned with them in any way. I was very focused on peer relationships. I do. I mean, I worry that I'll be. Um, I worry. I mean, I am out of touch, so I don't have to worry about being out of touch. But I've been out of touch for a long time. I don't listen to. Um, one Direction, but I also didn't listen to In Sync. I didn't listen to Justin Bieber. Like I have a long and storied tradition of being out of touch with pop culture that goes back to when I was a teenager. Um, I, my hope is that um, is that if I can just if I can just be authentic about it, you know, if I can be authentic about who I am, um, in my experience anyway, uh, you know, they respond very very positively to that. Uh, it's it's when um, it's when you try t to act like you aren't old that it gets super awkward. <laughs> there we must leave it. John, thank you so much. And thank you all very much for being so engaged and listening. I wish we had longer, but we don't. Thank you so much. And I'm very grateful. Thank yeah. you. Thank you guys again. Thank you.